Hello, my name is Andrew B. from NYU Langone Orthopedics, and today we'll be presenting our case on anterior cruciate ligament allograft reconstruction, augmented with a reinforced bioinductive collagen scaffold in the setting of a multiligamentous knee injury and lateral meniscal tear. These are my co-authors, and these are our disclosures. No industry support was provided to produce this video. Prior literature, as well as a recent study from the STAR network, have demonstrated that Multiligamentous knee injury with ACL and MCL ruptures are the most common pattern. Recent studies have also demonstrated that ACL revision rates are increased when managing the concomitant MCL rupture conservatively. When managing multiligamentous knee injuries, using allograft for ACL reconstruction can be advantageous to decrease surgical morbidity of graft harvest as well as surgical time and tourniquet time. However, when using allograft, Small diameter ACL grafts have been shown to increase risk for graft failure, particularly when less than 7 millimeters, and allograft augmentation to increase graft size has had variable outcomes in the literature. So in the multiligamentous knee injury setting, as well as in a primary ACL setting, there is a need for the ability to augment a tenuous allograft tissue or a too small autograft harvest size. This implant is a novel ligamentous augmentation option it is a bioinductive collagen reinforced scaffold and an off the shelf implant. It comes in two forms a ligamentous 5 by 250 millimeter form and a patch 23 by 30 millimeter form. It is made of a highly porous type 1 collagen with a 20 micrometer average pore size and a bioresorbable poly L lactide, PLLA for short, microfilaments that are 15 micrometers in diameter, providing a load sharing strength of 141 newtons at time zero of implantation. Recent studies have demonstrated the technical feasibility of using this bioinductive scaffold to augment tendons and ligaments to provide both time zero mechanical strength as well as long-term bioinductive capabilities. The case is a 44-year-old male who presents nine days after sustaining a right knee injury while skiing in Colorado. The injury was a twisting mechanism while going down moguls and led to a resultant fall and inability to continue skiing. He had an immediate effusion that has improved, but having pain and difficulty ambulating, and is currently using a knee immobilizer and crutches. There is no permanent medical history, and he's a non-smoker. On physical exam, he has an antalgic gait. He does have a moderate effusion. He is able to straight leg raise. However, his active knee range of motion is limited from minus 3 to 65 degrees. He has global joint tenderness and a positive 2B Lockman with trace pivot shift with guarding in the office. He has a positive anterior drawer. And notably, he has valgus stress with grade 2 to 3 opening at 30 degrees, as well as trace opening at 0 degrees. He has a negative varus stress, as well as a negative dial test, and he's nearvascularly intact distally. On plane radiographs, there's a notable large proximal MCL avulsion fracture off the medial femoral condyle, flipped 90 degrees in the soft tissue. There are no other notable acute osseous abnormalities. MRI of the knee without contrast demonstrates an ACL rupture, again visualizing the proximal MCL avulsion fracture with an intact distal MCL attachment as well as a lateral meniscal tear. This slide demonstrates notable MRI cuts on the coronal, sagittal, and axial, again demonstrating the aforementioned pathology. Treatment options for this patient include ACL reconstruction using autograft with BTB versus soft tissue autograft, allograft when taking consideration the multiligamentous knee injury option, plus minus augmentation of the graft. For the MCL, this can be managed non-operatively, repair with bony fixation, reconstruction, or repair or reconstruction with augmentation. For this patient, we chose allograft reconstruction due to the multiligamentous knee injury and lateral meniscal repair to decrease surgical time and morbidity. A BTB allograft with augmentation with this bioinductive collagen scaffold was chosen. However, we also present graft preparation for an all soft tissue option. The MCL was managed with repair with bony fixation with the ability to augment with the same bioinductive collagen scaffold if the tissue was tenuous. We will begin by discussing two forms of ACL allograft augmentation. Given the multiligamentous injury addressing both the ACL and MCL as well as lateral meniscus, 
the senior author's preference is to have the graft preparation completed prior to exsanguination of the limb to limit tourniquet time. The off-the-shelf bioinductive collagen scaffold is opened in ligamentous form in 5 by 250 millimeters. This is then used to augment a soft tissue allograft using a pre-constructed suture tape augmentation device. Care is taken to match the ends of the bioinductive collagen scaffold with the soft tissue graft and using the pre-constructed card to pass the tines of the clamp as well as the suture through both the center of the soft tissue graft as well as the suture tape augmentation device. The graft preparation can be done in standard fashion with experienced surgeons. However, each pass of the suture must be taken care to pass through the center of the bioinductive scaffold as well as a soft tissue graft. The finished product can be seen on one end of the graft. The graft is measured to the appropriate length and cut along with the bioinductive collagen scaffold. And the same steps are repeated on the other side of the graft to ensure flush tapered ends for graft passage. The graft is sized to 9.5 millimeters and 10 millimeters, and the final construct can be seen here. The graft ends are marked at 20 millimeters for future graft passage, and graft preparation is then complete. Next, we will discuss augmentation of BTB allograft with a bioinductive collagen reinforced scaffold, which was used for this case. BTB allograft preparation can be performed in the surgeon's preferred method with care taken to make sure the bioinductive scaffold is sutured flush with the bony end, overlaying only the soft tissue portion of the graft. This flush transition will allow smooth graft passage later on. Excess scaffold can be cut at the bony ends, and no suture is used in the center of the graft to avoid overcompression. 20 millimeters is marked from the end of the femoral bone plug, and this is the final construct. The patient is brought into the operating room, and an examination under anesthesia is performed. The patient's operative leg is placed in a leg holder, and the large C-arm should be positioned on the ipsilateral side to allow for MCL repair work. The patient's extremity is prepped and draped in the standard fashion. The surgeon's initials are confirmed on the operative extremity, and a preoperative timeout is performed. A standard diagnostic arthroscopy is performed, demonstrating an ACL rupture. The ACL is debrided and a notch plasty is performed for visualization, and the tibial footprint is marked. Entering the medial compartment, the medial meniscus can be seen to be avulsed from the medial capsule, as well as a rupture in the medial capsule at the location of the MCL rupture, and a positive medial drive-through sign can be seen. In the lateral compartment, Arthroscopic probe demonstrates a lateral meniscal posterior horn tear, which is debrided with the shaver. The tear is then repaired using an all-inside, suture-based, suture anchor repair device in horizontal mattress fashion across the tear. This is then repeated two more times, and on further arthroscopic probing, a parrot beak oblique tear is again seen. So an all-inside meniscal repair device with knotless technology is used to repair this tear. Good meniscal compression is seen at this time. Standard anterior medial portal drilling for the femoral tunnel is performed using flexible reamers to a depth of 22 millimeters. The femoral tunnel is then notched, and sutures are passed through the femoral tunnel. The tibial tunnel is then drilled using a tibial ACL guide in standard fashion to the size of the BTB allograft with the bioinductive scaffold reinforced. The graft is then passed in standard fashion through the tibial tunnel with care taken to use the arthroscopic probe to help the graft pass in particular the bone soft tissue junction to the 20 millimeter mark. The graft is fixed with interference screws in the femur and prior to tibial fixation, the knee is taken through a range of motion to ensure no impingement at extremes of extension as well as flexion. 
the graft is cycled. The tibial side is fixed with a biocomposite interference screw as well. And arthroscopic examination demonstrates excellent stability of the ACL graft along with the bioinductive collagen reinforced scaffold. Attention is then turned to the medial collateral ligament rupture. The bony fragment can be visualized in the soft tissue flipped 90 degrees. The bony fragment is freed and the fracture bed is cleared of soft tissue. A K wire is placed to confirm anatomic proximal MCL origin and a guide wire for a cannulated screw is placed to reduce the fragment and a 40 millimeter partially threaded cannulated screw is placed. Remnant sutures of the MCL bony fragment interface are then used to tie down the posterior oblique ligament with excellent stability seen at valgus stress at 0 and 30 degrees. The patient's incisions are closed primarily. Postoperatively, the patient is made partial weight bearing at 25% with a hinge knee brace locked in extension, allowed to be unlocked from 0 to 90 degrees starting on post-op day 3 while resting in a chair. For DVT prophylaxis, aspirin 81 mg BID is prescribed for four weeks and no antibiotic prophylaxis is indicated. At two weeks, the first postoperative visit, the sutures are removed, the partial weight bearing is continued due to the lateral meniscal repair. However, if the lateral meniscus was intact at time of surgery, this would be advanced to weight bearing as tolerated. Physical therapy prescription is given to begin at week three, and at six weeks post op, the patient is advanced to full weight bearing as tolerated, advanced to full range of motion, however, keeping the hinge knee brace on for varus valgus stability, and PT is continued. At three months post op, the brace is discontinued and light straight line jogging is allowed, and at six months post op, the patient is allowed to initiate controlled cutting activities and a gradual return to sport. At most recent follow up, at 14 months, the patient is doing well without pain, however, he does have mild numbness anterior to the MCL incision. He has returned to skiing and weekend softball without pain or instability, and on physical exam, he does have 0.5 centimeter quad circumferential atrophy compared to the contralateral, no effusion, and excellent range of motion from 0 to 135 degrees. He is a grade 1A lockman with a negative anterior drawer, and he is stable to valgus stress at 0 and 30 degrees, and he is near vascularly intact. The senior author has been using this technique for bone, tendon, bone, and soft tissue allograft augmentation for three years with his bioinductive collagen reinforced scaffold. There are 27 patients with greater than one year follow up and a total of 41 patients with a mean follow up of 12.7 months, with two patients being lost to follow up. On average, the postoperative knee range of motion is excellent from 0 0.3 degrees to 127.8 degrees. There have been zero graft failures and two or 4.9% overall revision surgery, both for superficial infection IND. There are several pearls and pitfalls to this procedure. Pearls being, surgeons should always practice graft preparation on cadaver ligament prior to patient use, particularly when using the soft tissue graft augmentation using the pre-constructed suture tape augmentation. If the surgical center and assistance allow, the surgeon should begin allograft preparation prior to surgical procedure time to decrease overall surgical time. For soft tissue augmentation using the pre-constructed suture tape augmentation, laying the bioinductive collagen reinforced scaffold on the opposite side of the graft as the suture tape augmentation implant optimizes compressive structural integrity and graft tubularization. For BTB allograft augmentation, securing only the ends of the bioinductive collagen reinforced scaffold to the soft tissue portion of the graft allows avoidance of 1. bone tunnel soft tissue diameter mismatch and 2 over tethering the length of the soft tissue portion of the graft with multiple sutures. And lastly, the ligamentous form of the bioinductive scaffold is 250 millimeters long and can be cut and used for multiple ligament augmentation in a single surgery to reduce costs. For example, in this patient, if the MCL tissue was attenuated, the remaining bioinductive scaffold could have been used to reinforce the MCL. There are several pitfalls of the procedure as well, mainly not having all available assistance, instruments, and implants ready at beginning the procedure or using the bioinductive scaffold solely for graft, as it was developed and indicated solely for ligament, tendon, or graft augmentation. Other pitfalls include augmenting an already large diameter graft, as the scaffold adds approximately 1 to 2 millimeters of graft width, which could lead to notch impingement or a risk for postoperative cyclops lesions. Other pitfalls include sizing the allograft and using corresponding tunnel reamers prior to augmenting with the bioinductive scaffold, which will make graft passage difficult, if not impossible. And lastly, failing to ensure flush, tapered ends of the scaffold when augmenting soft tissue grafts 
or failing to ensure a smooth transition from bone block to soft tissue augmented graft when augmenting the BTB allograft, as this will also make graft passage difficult. These are our references, and thank you very much.